We are born free. And we will die free. The time in between, though, that's complicated. In that time, governments, institutions, and our egos will limit our ability to find true freedom in this life. These are real stories of real people overcoming the odds, persevering in justice, and unlocking their potential. Welcome to Finding Freedom. Here's your host, John Oderman. Welcome back to Finding Freedom right here on the Lions of Liberty podcast. And I'm really excited today to bring you an awesome guest. It's been a little while, maybe a couple months um, since I've talked to uh, you know, someone who has been through the criminal justice system and has come out on the other side to find success after prison. Of course, those of you know who've listened to my show for a long time, um, this was really the only interviews I did for years and years, um, talking to hundreds of uh, formerly incarcerated individuals who have really turned their lives around and overcome obstacles and found success after prison. So excited to bring you another powerful story today. Uh, today, I am joined by Christopher Willers. In 2003, he was sentenced to 144 months in prison. Um, he is out now, and he is a, uh, a home. He, he owns a, with his wife a uh, a vocational school with a hundred percent graduation rate, which is near Atlanta, Georgia. He's a social content creator, a prisoner's rights advocate, a mental health advocate. He's a public speaker. He's doing everything he can in his power right now to help to get his message out there to change things and to change the criminal justice system. Christopher, welcome to Finding Freedom. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on the show. Um, and you know, I, I know you're someone, as I talked about in the intro there, um, you're very open with your story, um, wanting to, uh, to help others by, uh, by sharing what you've been through. And, uh, that's, you know, that's really one of the, the main, um, emphasis of, of my show is taking personal stories um, where people can really apply, um, lessons learned from other people to, to apply to their own lives. And, uh, you know, I think people who have been to prison, um, a story like that, and the obstacles you've been through and what you've seen, I don't think it only helps people who are either are going to prison or who have been to prison. I think there are a lot of um, lessons inside a story like this that can help people in almost any walk of life. So I'm excited yeah. to, uh, to dig into that. Uh, probably first place to start, let's go back, back in time to where you grew up, um, your, your childhood home, um, if you could talk a little bit about what it was like, w where'd you grow up and uh, what was that experience like for you? Yeah, um, grew up in a suburb right outside of Chicago, Illinois, uh, Glendale Heights. Um, initially, mom and dad together lived in a nice ranch style, you know, three bedroom, cul-de-sac, big backyard, uh, but Parents, you know, ended up having some problems in the marriage. Um, tried to work it out. Dad would come and go. In those moments, things would kind of decline financially for me and mom because she was, I was with mom. Um, and we, you know, eventually we lost the house. We ended up in a townhouse, an apartment, and then a uh, rougher part of the city. And in the midst of that, I guess I was just like any other kid. You know, I had my friends. I was a pretty good kid in the house. Uh, but when mom's at work, working two jobs so she can keep a roof over our head, you know, I'm out there wandering around and checking the city out and riding bikes and getting into trouble a little bit. And um, it was just that, you know, I was always, I guess, one foot in, one foot out. I was good academically, but I would run into situations where I might get into a fight or two at school. Um, never got in any real trouble. I did end up getting expelled from school, high school, ended up going to a program after that, ran by the Army National Guard um, because I got into a bad, pretty bad fight at school, even mm -hmm. though the guy was picking on me. Um, and then from there, I ended up actually enlisting in the military, United States Air Force at 17 years old um, after my mom signed the permission slip for me to do so. What, what um, made you want to join the military? 
Uh, I think I just seen it as a way to get away from Chicago. And at the same time, I was I was one of those angry, rebellious teams. I was one of those, you know, I'm angry at the world for no apparent reason, teenagers. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I also seen as an opportunity to not just travel, get away from Chicago, but maybe let off some some steam. Not saying I wanted to go to war, but I'm like, well, I like to fight, so let me join the army or something. You know, that was the mentality. And what what year was this when you joined the military? Uh, this was in 2001. Yeah, I was 17. Oh shit! So so was this was this before 9/11? Right, then? right, yeah. When I got a basic, I, out of text, I got to my first base, uh, my first permanent base of state duty station. And then 9 11 hit. I was in my oh, wow. Air Force base. Yeah, up there. Yeah, it got real. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, you know, uh, in the military, I was too young still. I wasn't mature enough to be out there. The military, I think sometimes if you've never been in the military, you think when you're on base, like there's a portal or something where everybody's perfect and always in military mode. And it's the farthest thing from that. Um, you know, I fell in with a, cr a pretty rough crowd in the mil in the air force, believe it or not, you know, guys mm -hmm. that drank all the time and party all the time and, um, you know, get locked up for fighting and stuff like that. Eventually I got in trouble. Um, and getting a general uh, discharge under honorable conditions because they were just like, man, you're just too young. Like, you're not a bad guy, but you're not getting in trouble here on base, but you're getting in trouble around base. So we got to let you go. Um, after that, my mother, while I was in the military, had moved from Chicago to Virginia, where we, where she's originally from, uh, the majority of my family are from. And I left the military or got kicked out of the military, went to Chicago for two or three months where I was basically living in hotels and, uh, you know, different chicks I was hanging out with at the time or whatever. And then eventually went to Virginia. And I remember my grandmother telling me, she said, baby, this is the Commonwealth. This is different than where you're from. This isn't Chicago anymore. This is the South. And I didn't know what that meant then. I do now, especially now. I live in Georgia now, so I definitely know a little bit about the South. But um, I had fell in with an older cousin in Virginia, older about, about 10 years, didn't know anybody aside from a girl I had met at McDonald's and started dating one day. Um, fell in with him and his buddies, ended up agreeing one night to get in the truck, drive them to go rob a place, the only reason I agreed was because they had BB guns. Nobody was going to be physically harmed. So I was like, well, mm -hmm. if something goes crazy, I know some, nobody's going to die or anything like that. We went, uh, we got away with it. Well, then in the moment. Um, and then, you know, things just kind of went spiraled out of control. You know, they were doing other things. Uh, cops eventually started, you know, approaching them about other crimes and then, what we had did got sucked into that. And next thing you know, um, I'm facing prison time, you know, and that's kind of like the short sped up version right there of what led me to prison. And, and that was, that was your first time ever getting arrested for anything? First. Yeah. First time ever arrested. Uh, no prior. I had a, the only other time I had actually got arrested or got a ticket was for possession of tobacco by a minor and a ticket for driving or being in a vehicle without a seatbelt. Those are the only other infractions. Um, so I what, learned. I was going to say, what were you charged with then? Yeah. So in Commonwealth, they don't have uh, accessory, or at least at the time they did not. They may now. So whether you went into a dwelling or held a gun or as long as you participated in that crime, you received the same charges as mm. anybody else that was a part of the crime. Um, and on top of that, uh, at well, according to back then, again, they may have changed now. The gun charges, a BB gun is still a gun charge. Really? It's a BB. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But that, yeah. Anything that can imitate um, anything that can fire projectiles, etc. at that time. 
was still listed as a firearm charge. Yep. And then uh, what I tell a lot of the young guys now when I'm talking to the to these guys here in Atlanta and, and you know any other opportunity I have is when you get a robbery charge, often we think we'll get charged with robbery for just the dwelling that we entered or the store or whatever it is. But you actually get a robbery charge for each individual that's within a certain foot, you know, mm. square footage that where that crime took place. So I ended up getting six robberies, six conspiracy charges, and six gun charges. Each gun charge is a mandatory count at the time. The first one, three, each additional one after that, a mandatory five. So off rip, 28 wow. mandatory year. Yeah. And everyone else you were with got the the exact same charges, essentially? Yeah, exact same charges, but by the time the smoke cleared and we made it through the courts, different time, different sentencing. Mm -hmm. So you're sitting in jail. This is the, you know, the, your first real run in with the law. What, what's going through your mind as you're sitting there? Man, um, sitting in jail. I mean, never been to jail. Matter of fact, I spent one night in jail prior to all this. I did. I think I had, I got a charge for, might have been fighting or something in North Dakota. I spent a night. Prior to that, I mean, prior to this time, I guess the difference is back then I knew I was getting out the next day. This time I didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, they took me straight to the hole or segregation, what they call the Yellow Brick Road. I still remember it to this day, Rappahannock Regional Jail. And I remember just guys screaming and you can just hear the echoes and there was a light that was continuously on. Um, everything was yellow, the doors were green. And then you had to share the floor of this six by nine cell with it's just concrete and a toilet with another dude. And in my case, it was a guy that was homeless um, and obviously had mental health issues. So I was just kind of like stuck in this environment. And I was used to, you know, I was one of those teenagers or whatever. I was used to always driving somewhere, you know, hanging out with a chick, being, so, you know, I was always on the move working. Even after the military, I had got a job working at Walmart, changing tires, you know, I was still moving. And now everything stopped. And it, and I think that's what, what hit me. I, I felt no longer in control, no longer invincible. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of teenagers do, we feel invincible. So how... How old were you at that point in time? 19. You're 19. Okay. Um, so what, what happens next? Uh, I mean, we go, we end up, you know, going through the legal procedures. They actually offered me an opportunity to cooperate day one. Could have went home day one. I turned it down. Um, you know, as a 19 year old kid back then, I just looked at things different. You know, I didn't really understand life and what <laughs> what was really going on. Um, and at the same time, everybody else took the deal. They all cooperated. Mm. Um, so I went basically up the creek uh, with a uh, attorney that I didn't pay for. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that was given mm. to me by the courts. And now I pissed them off so they didn't want to give me a plea. So there was there was not even a plea where I could say, at least weigh it out. Um, going through the court system, my you know, my attorney, I guess he tried. You know, I mean, looking back now, I guess it could have been worse. Um definitely probably could have been better. But I was watching guys in this area of Virginia go to jail or go to prison for robbery charges, one robbery charge, and they're getting life sentences. You know, I watched two 16 year olds, um, probably a month before I was going up to get sentenced or go to court, both get life sentences for robbery, robbing a pizza guy. So I knew there wasn't any help coming just like a bunch of teenagers. That's why I'm so vocal now, a bunch of, Teenagers between 18 and 22 that are put in these positions because of decisions that they're making, but at the same time, we're pipeline and position and posture to be in these, you know, these places. Um, I'm sitting there, no help, 
they speed up my court date. I, you know, they wake me up one morning like, hey, you got to go to court. I'm not expecting to go to court for another week. I'm like, what the heck's going on? I go to court. I walk into court or walk into the bullpen or whatever. The, the lawyer comes back there. He says, man, the best I can do is give you 35 years to do in prison. And I looked at him. I'm like, man, I can't do that. Yeah, I was like, I was like, I literally just drove a vehicle, man. I said, they already told on everything. You guys know what I did. They told you what I did. I drove. I didn't touch the gun, the BB gun. I didn't go in. And although I know people got, you know, impacted mentally and emotionally, still, I didn't go in and do it, man. Um, so when I told him that, he's like, well, I got you got to tell them something. This is literally what he says. He's like, I got to tell them something. Tell me what to tell them. And as a 19-year-old kid, I have to make a decision of how much time I can give up off my life that I think is fair to make them happy and still come home to live some sort of life. So I went in there, mm -hmm. I, or I told him, I said, man, tell him I just want to be home before I'm 40. And he went in there, they had a talk, whatever it is. I went in front of the judge again, no plea. I had to just go in front of him, throw myself at the, the mercy of the court. So to say my mother spoke her piece. Um, I spoke my piece about the positive thing, being in the military, stuff like that, never getting in trouble. And then he granted, I guess he granted my wish. He gave me 19 years at 19 years old. So it was 144 years all but suspended or all suspended but 19. Okay. So, yeah, I, I misspoke at the beginning. So it was 144 years but, but suspended. Okay. Yeah. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah. Man, so so when I mean you're you're 19 years old and you hear that sentence read to you, I mean what's what's going through your mind? How do you even comprehend that? Man, it's so weird. People think I make this up, but in some weird way, I was like, okay, I live to see another day. I can make it through this because again, mm -hmm. I was watching people with less charges get more time you know, get life sentences. And I really thought that that's what was going to happen. I thought, I, yeah. I thought right there, I, I didn't think for one second, this conversation could be had. I thought that day when I went in there, I was doing life. So. Yeah. so well, that that's kind of interesting in that you had prepared yourself for, for the, I mean, the worst, the worst of the worst, I guess. So when, when you hear that, it's like, well, I, I guess I didn't get the, the worst possible outcome. Uh, so, so did that, did that inform your mindset going in? Did that kind of, it's kind of weird to say, but you're going into prison. Did that improve your, your, your attitude? Do you think starting out? Uh, no, not initially. Initially it was just about survival. Yeah. Um, it was still a long time to try to have to survive. That was my thought before prison when I got my time at the jail, but when I got mm. sent to prison, it was a level four maximum security. It was gangland. I mean, and I had no allies. I'm from out of, out of state. I'm from Chicago, locked up in Virginia. So now it was automatic. It was just fight or flight. It was no longer, yeah, I'm going to make it through this. It was like, okay, I got to make it through the day because mm. my second day, my first day on the compound going to chow, we walked over a dude. He had his jaw broke and his pants were pulled down in the stairwell. Everybody was just walking over him. And my second day, I literally watched two guys in the middle of the dorm or excuse me, in the middle of the pod. They had their knives, you know, taped or tied to their hands with their bed sheets. And they were just poking each other. Just, hey, whoever falls first. Jeez. So yeah. how, how did you survive? Man, I mean, uh, probably the fifth or sixth day there, I got approached by a bunch of guys from uh, Richmond. Well, five guys to be exact. They jumped, you know, jumped me. Took, I guess, what I had. I didn't really have much coming from the jail. Um, I remember, you know, I got, I got banged up pretty bad. Went to medical, uh, didn't tell, ended up signing a waiver. A lot of people don't know this. Your loved ones can sign a waiver that says, 
Um, basically, please put me back in this dorm or I don't want to be removed from this dorm. If anything happens to me, it's not the responsibility of the Department of Corrections. So uh, as a young, angry 19 year old that just got jumped in prison or now at the time I'm 20, by the time I made it to prison, I signed the waiver, went back in the dorm, went to the, I guess, like the big dogs of that city. And I was like, man, I want to fight all these guys one on one um, because I'm not going nowhere. Uh, Some other guys from different cities and some of the gangs, they didn't like what happened. They didn't like the fact that I got jumped. They started to rally behind me. Um, And sometimes in prison, things like that get set up. So over the course of about a day and a half, I ended up fighting all of them. Didn't win all of them. I still got, you know, but I got my respect. Yeah. That's that's crazy. I mean, just... (sighs) It, and I'm sure it's tough for even you to uh, to explain or or to go into details there, but literally having to fight for your life. I mean, be, being confronted with that. Um, I mean, choo- choosing to. A lot of guys yeah. wouldn't have gone that route, but I didn't want to hide and I didn't want to run the whole time I was trying to mm-hmm. finish 17, 18, 19 years. So, so after, I mean – after those first couple of days, after, I mean, after you go through this, this gauntlet of fights, um, what kind of position did you find yourself in and how did that set you up for the rest of your, your time in prison? Uh, I had influence uh, immediately. The guys that were from out of state, different States, we kind of started hanging out with one another and walking the yard together and, um, and then I was a pretty smart guy, you know, I was former United States Air Force, you know, I never struggled there. So I'm in an environment where guys needed help. They were, they, whether it was with legal work, letters, uh, anything. So I use that to my advantage. Actually, I used to get a lot of the good jobs in the kitchen. I'd be the clerk. I'd do clerical work. I ended up getting jobs with counselors, um, and I knew how to communicate and I began to form a bond with staff and obviously with the guys that I was with. Um, and I was able to start teaching classes and stuff like that further down the road. Um, so I was a pretty positive guy. I, you know, I got into my fights. I did, you know, run with a rougher crowd younger, you know, or earlier on in my bid, but I was always somebody that helped and, you know, was focused for the most part. I just knew that, like I said early on, it was more day to day as opposed to, okay, I'm going to make it home. Like it was, I got to make it past these first five years. I got to make it off Mm -hmm. this compound. I got to, you know, that was the mentality for the longest before I really thought about freedom. So can you talk a little bit more about that breaking, you know, breaking it down into, uh, into smaller segments I mean, because I, honestly, I think that can apply to almost anything in life, any kind of goal or, or you know, or, or something you're trying to accomplish. You know, they say, you know, you know, you don't you don't eat an elephant in uh, in one bite. So like, did that just yeah. come to you naturally? Just kind of kind of breaking it down and, and looking at, you know, different chunks of time to, to get you where you need to be. You talking about as far as like being able to move and maneuver through that or. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I always my mother, man, my mother is is she's 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 an amazing person. She always taught me to use my differences as my strong suits. Um, her favorite story is she tells people I learned the big words first, you know. So I was always like the class clown or whatever, or I was always one of the guys picked first in gym. Um, I'm biracial, you know what I'm saying? So I use that to my advantage. I, I, it's easy for me to connect. I listen to all types of music growing up now. I can relate to everybody, I feel like. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was just easy for me to connect. It was just, there was a specific time where individuals like my brother Jefferson Ellie, who was still fighting for his freedom, and um, Willie Brown, they, they kind of stepped in and were like, hey man, do you know, do you understand you have influence? You're a leader, you know? Which way are you leading people? Do you understand even the the staff, they kind of pay attention to you. Like, and so, you know, I always got to salute them and get in their roses because 
I definitely, I had individuals, and even to this day, that stepped in and were like, hey, you, you got to go this way. You got the potential to do this. Don't, even though you're in prison, you're going home. And at the time, these were guys, though one of them is home and the other isn't, these were guys that were facing life sentences, you know, and they were still motivating people and, and educating. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, what you've talked about there and, and kind of how, how you navigated prison using, you know, just your, your natural abilities or, you know, sk skills you've learned over time um, to, to your advantage. And, uh, you know, like you said, you were a leader and I think you were, you're probably a, a, a natural leader to, to some degree. And, and that stuff kind of just came naturally to you. So take us through the, the rest of your time in prison. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're breaking down your, your time into chunks in order to get through it. Um, mm -hmm. at what point did you see the light at the end of the tunnel? Man, um, so I went through my, my knucklehead phase early on, grew out of that, you know, started to find out who I was, grow up, mature in that environment. But it was still like, okay, I got to get to low level. Low level is basically in Virginia is level twos or lower. So I started in level a level four. I went to a three, back to a four because I got into a little trouble fighting, which was my early on track record. And then I started to finally work my way down. Um, while at Greensville, I was still in, I call myself like super prison mode looking back then. I was, I was moving in a way that I should have been preparing myself, but I was just, it was just the environment, you know, and the yeah. ability and the access and just, I guess just what the culture of that prison was. And it just, I didn't, I don't like that part of me looking back. Um, Cause I really, I feel like I, that was the one part of my prison sentence where I fed into the, the, the prison stereotype. Um, I started hit, I finally made it to a level two. Then um, one day they, you know, they told me for the longest I couldn't go to a level one. Um, I was able to get on the phone, call my then uh, fiance who I met while I was incarcerated. And I told her, I was like, Hey, they're shipping me to a level one. Um, and I think that's when it finally began to be real. Um, it's just, I guess, when the the impossible or when when they told me for the longest I wasn't going to reach a certain place and then it happened, I was like, OK, they moving me to a level one for a reason. This is real. I'm getting ready to go home. You're going to a work camp like it's OK. And I remember, um, well, now my, my wife presently. She told me, she was like, you need to start giving something away once a month. Just start letting go. And she's like, every time you let something go, she's like, um, I'm going to give you something to work on. And at the time, whether it was cryptocurrency, researching that, or real estate, or credit, she would just give me something to replace. And she helped me kind of prepare. And wow. it became, to get, yeah, it became to get real. Uh, it, it, it got real then. Yeah. That's, that's really, really interesting. So, by, you know, kind of getting you to start to preframe, you know, your life after prison, starting to, you know, remove things from it now while well, you're still there and, you know, entering some new ideas, cryptocurrency, credit. That's that's really, really smart. Wow. So you, your fiance, you you met her. Did you did you know her before you went in or did no. you? Did you Okay. Yeah, no, I um I was on at the time St. Bride's Correctional Center. I was doing seminars. I was able to speak to different colleges like JMU and uh, Mary Washington, and they would come in and do um, justice related seminars with people getting ready to enter the field and I, you know, do Q and A. Um, I was facilitating seminars uh, to the men in there, and a buddy of my my right hand at the time was. Um, his wife, she had seen me speak at about two or three events that the families were able to come in. Um, and then she just liked how her husband kind of, you know, I don't, I don't want to say he listened to what I said, but I was a good, you know, good, I don't know, good guy to be around. And she ended up uh, introducing me to my now wife. But at the time it was business related. I was running a nonprofit with a buddy of mine, Freddie Williams, and the in my empowerment project. Um, and my you were wife, running a nonprofit while you were in prison. You started a nonprofit. Yes, sir. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 
How how um, how did that come about? Uh, a mentor of mine who was formerly incarcerated, incarcerated at the time would be Freddie Williams. Mm-hmm. Um, he's real big on leadership and communication. And in there, he was sitting as a worship leader or basically what it, what's a pastor out mm-hmm. here. So over about 230 men that were in a church on that institution. So yeah. he came about with a program about developing leadership from the inside out. And we fought. You know, he brought me on because I had influence, you know, um, and we clicked and uh, we just started challenging the staff there to bring in more resources for the guys, not just for us getting ready to go home, but for the guys across the yard so they can shift their perspective. Um, And then we did a lot of, you know, teaching. We were able to they gave us a lot of room, you know, a lot of a lot Mm -hmm. of green to teach and develop and have seminars and stuff like that in there. Yeah. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. So take us through the, uh, you know, ultimately when you find out you're going home, what that moment was like, <clears throat> who was there and, uh, you know, just kind of what, what you remember most from it. Yeah. Um, I'm on, I was on Nottoway work center. It was crazy. I came home January 13th, 2020, December 19th. December of 19, the dorm I was in, and up until I was getting ready to go home, got uh, quarantined because everybody respiratory illness had began to outbreak on the institution, and they didn't know what it was, and guys oh, wow. were falling out at the count line and couldn't get out of bed. And I remember I didn't get sick, and but we but they wouldn't let me out. They you're locked in with these guys. It is what it is. And I'm like, yo, I'm, I'm talking to my wife and I'm like, man, I don't want to get this and I'm getting ready to go home. These guys, some of them, they were getting rolled out and didn't come back. I don't, I'm sure they they lit. I hope. I don't know. But um, so it was that. It was a lot of anxiety. I, I'm finishing 16 years, 11 months in prison. I'm going home to a way better situation than a lot of guys I know. You know, I'm going home to a wife that is goal driven. I'm going home to a home, you know, a house in a cul-de-sac, you know, in a suburb in Atlanta. And, um, you know, I still have my challenges, but it's 17 years nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Uh, I finally make it out the morning, you know, the night before I don't, I didn't sleep. I took my shower. I was up all night. Um, the morning of go, you know, I go change, I walk out the doors and here we go. You know, I got the video and I'm looking at the video, you know, yesterday I wasn't smiling. Somebody commented on that, um, on a TikTok or something like he wasn't smiling. He doesn't even look happy. It wasn't that I was exhausted. And I remember I was like, man, it's finally over. And I might've been in shock. You know, I, I walked out the door. My mother's still alive, thank God. You know, I can show her who I am now. I get a second chance. Uh, my cousin's there. My uncle who had a stroke when my grandmother died, he he's there. I get to see him. My wife, she, you know, for me, excuse my little, well, I'm gonna say holy crap, because now I'm like, okay, I really am married. You know, just being honest, she's thrusting a smartphone in my face with, it's, she's like, you got messages already. And when I got locked up, they had Nokia chirps the, or Nextel chirps or whatever phones they were. And people barely even text. There was no Facebook. And here we go. Um, went to yeah. McDonald's that morning and I had to order my food from a touchscreen. At the time, I had no idea how to operate that. And McDonald's tasted like roof crisp that morning. You know, it doesn't <laughs> taste like that now. <laughs> but, um, you know, nonetheless... That happened. Um, I got my license the first day home, you know, and then he, that was weird. Um, and then I mean, I'm just free. You know what I'm saying? That's really it. Here we go. Um, come home. I remember Kobe and his daughter and the passengers passing. And then I remember the world shutting down hmm. and the news is saying there's a, there's a sickness and, they're closing jobs and my PO is like, you got to have a job. And I'm like, what the hell? 
You know, and it was just a lot, man. After 17 yeah. years, I was like, is the world ending? I just got home. Yeah, that's a, a crazy time. I mean, I'm sure it's crazy anytime to get out of prison after 17 years, but to get out and then to have that crap happen with uh, with COVID in, in 2020 and the lockdowns and businesses closing. Um, what was what was the hardest part of that, of navigating that time? I think, you know, I think for me, I took on a lot of weight and the further along my, I call it my second, my second chance journey, I'm learning even because I'm really goal driven. I still, I got established boundaries for myself. I can't try to save everybody around me. I can't try to fill um, voids, you know, that I feel like I left because I was gone for so long. So it's just, not putting too much on me because I initially did that in the midst of the pandemic. Um, and, you know, I just put a lot on me for somebody that came home after 17 years. I didn't give myself enough time to really examine who I was and address, you know, the trauma that I went through that, that happens mm -hmm. when you do 17 years of prison. I think I kind of tried to just keep on going, floor it, pat, floor it over the speed bump, so to say. Instead of slow down and address it, yeah, that's what I did. And I, and I see a lot of guys. I have a lot of conversations now. You know, hope, a lot of times I try to catch guys before, you know, but mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. the conversation comes after because they, they run into the same things. That's a lot a lot of our problem. I mean, what can be done, though, can be done? To, to really help? It's just education, right, and, and kind of learning from others' mistakes? Yeah, I mean, and getting actual mental health. Uh, mm -hmm. in prison. One of the things I'm going to start really pushing for heavy now that I'm starting to connect with different organizations and people is mental health six months prior to release and six months or to six months after mandatory. And I know some of the guys that are locked up, they're probably going to be pissed off or whatever because I'm pushing for that. But sometimes you, you don't know what you need until you get it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of guys that are coming home from prison late, you know, the women too, um, juvenile, if you've been incarcerated, there's a good chance you have PTSD or environmental based depression. Um, you might've had thoughts of suicide, you know, the, the, the list goes on and on. Or sometimes guys don't know because they've just become acclimated to the environment and they're stuck in a trauma hole or, you know, a stress hole for so long. They think it's normal. Mm -hmm. And they still operate in that that mode out here. So, yeah, I think we need more mental health assistance for sure. So let's talk about the uh, vocational school that you and your wife have. How how did that come about? And uh, you know what what really motivated you to to go in that direction? Yeah, um, me and my wife, she, she's goal driven like me. Um, like I said, we met while I was running a nonprofit. She was just basically, I was looking for somebody to help advise, get, just teach me more about 501 C3s, et cetera, whatever it was. She was mm -hmm. extremely intelligent. Um, somebody that I learned from. So we began talking, having a conversation over the course of some months. Our first business we started while I was still incarcerated was a t-shirt business called thank God online. Um, where we were just pushing like, the scripture with a dope saying and, you know, trying to get the word out there and do something positive. Mm -hmm. um, that didn't go too good, but it showed us, I think it showed each other that we try, you know, um, over the course uh, prior to me coming home, I told her, I was like, well, if we get married, you know, what do you want? You know, what's your, what's one of your, your biggest dream? And she's like, I want a school. She's like, I love, she's like, I want a cosmetology school. I love teaching. I've been doing hair since 11, blah, blah. I was like, well, I'm going to get you to school. Um, came home. Uh, pandemic hit. I was working on the back of a garbage truck some day or some of the months and 16 hours in uh, the warehouse. That closed down because the pandemic back on the garbage truck. Garbage men make good money. There was nothing else to spend money on. Um, man, I put money into our home. I put money into a business where me and a buddy were selling Chicago style food on the side of the road. 
because you can do that in Atlanta. It's a big hustle out here. Mm -hmm. We ended up getting a food truck. I got a food truck. I uh, thought we were going to open a food truck, took the food truck, flipped the food truck, and, you know, took that money, invested, and, you know, eventually just kept making the right moves until I was able to get my wife to school. Like, it was, wow. it was a straight grind. Yeah, it was a straight grind. It was a lot of, it was some, no, it was a lot of luck. No, I'm going to say a lot of God, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, it was... It was just hard work. It's being with somebody else that's focused. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, I always tell people she's stronger. I'm, I'm more inclined to quit or give up. She's not. She's a faith warrior. You know, she's a faith walker. So we work good together. You know, when I get discouraged, she's like, no, you got this. Um, and then we got the school. You know, the school, uh, we're both passionate about people. My wife, it was her dream, but she said, you're my husband. You lead our household. I want you to be the executive director or what we call principal, because I feel like executive director is too, I don't know, formal or whatever. So um, at first I thought it was crazy. I'm an ex-felon, you know, tattoos mm -hmm. everywhere. Uh, but I am a licensed barber. I got my barber license while I was locked up because I wanted to impress my wife, make her my wife. So I got that. <laughs> So I wasn't completely blind, and I guess I did have leadership skills now that I could transfer over here. Um, so the name of our school is Last and Layers of Beauty Institute. It's in Tucker, Georgia. You can check us out, www.lastandlayersofbeauty.com. Um, we, I don't know, we care about people. We're big on social responsibility, and we teach more than just the beauty education. Um, we... Uh, give over $30,000 away in scholarships yearly to future educators, future instructors, because we believe in, you know, making sure our industry continues to go forward. We, you know, we connect with different organizations like the NAACP and, um, uh, man, Think Big and, and other organizations, excuse me, charge it to my, uh, my mind and not my heart, um, because we just want to get active and stay active in the community. And then we also provide education outside of beauty. We bring in people to teach about financial literacy and uh, small business development, uh, how to do your taxes and stuff like that. Because a lot of our students, we know, especially here in Atlanta, you know, they're, they're, they're from the south side or east side. And if you're from Atlanta, mm -hmm. then you know, you know what I'm saying. And I live on the east side, so that's not a, a, a shot of nothing. That, you know, I love the east side. Um, but we just really care about people. That's our strong suit. We got dope instructors like Miss Laura. Um, we got people with good reputations and I just focus on connecting with people. Man. You know? Well, it's uh, you, you were talking about the other stuff you teach, teaching about you know, taxes and how to start a business. Um, yeah. Honestly, most places where people grow up, go into a public school, they don't teach that stuff. So, I mean, right. that's, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's awesome that you've uh, that you've added that in. That's that's really cool. Um, we're running out of time here, Christopher. But uh, before I let you go, um, just you know, if you could just give a, a couple takeaways, you know, or, or, or maybe you know something that um, something that you've you've learned about yourself um, while owning a business, while you know launching this business with uh, with your wife. Man, about the business. Wow. Um, whew, there's no perfect time. If you have a dream, just go. There's never going to be a perfect time. Um, go and figure it out along the way. You're going to learn so much. It's going to be hard. It's going to be the most difficult thing you can ever do. But it's going to be rewarding. You're either going to be stressed working for somebody else and making sure their dreams continue to be true, or you're going to be stressed making sure your dreams come true so eventually – you can become a little bit less stressed. Um, and I would just say attached to that note, it's not necessarily business related because maybe you're not uh, a business, an entrepreneur, so to say, which is okay. Um, time is something you can't get back. So if it's not a business dream that you have, if you got a dream of, of I don't know, moving to Thailand or I don't know, Mexico or whatever, or learning to fly a plane, uh, do that. Because once time has gone, you don't get it back. You know, there's no reset. There's no go back. Um, so just cherish your time. Understand how valuable it is. Be careful who you give it to. You know, give it to those who value your time and value their own and, and live life, man. 
it's 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 stressful out in this world, but you can still find your peace amongst the chaos. Follow up question to that. So, do, do you think that um, you know there were certain lessons or things you learned about yourself while you were in prison um, that have helped you to find success either in business or in other areas, um, you know, in, in the outside world? Yeah, I, I, it's funny. I'm the I'm the the guy that's been to prison, but my reputation is. Uh, I'm known as a straight edge businessman, which means I, I I'm every everything is by the book. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to get in trouble. I guess that I guess that's step one, right? Um, but step two, I worked hard with my wife to make sure we have a school. So I've got that reputation. I've also got my reputation. I'm, I'm a tough negotiator. You know, I, I fight hard um, for my people. I don't even I know my value, so I don't really fight to establish my value as much as I try to fight to establish the value of those that are connected to me. Um, and that's it. You know, I just care about people and I got that from prison. Um, I, I knew coming home from prison, I wanted to be a voice or an example of those guys that were still locked up um, to say, Hey, you need, you need to let some of those guys out too. They need a second chance, you know? And then naturally I think I just, I gravitated to, who in society a lot of times people count out, you know, mm -hmm. and that's what it is. All right. And lastly, if you could plug your, your social media, I know you you create content, you plug your uh, business again, if you want to, or anything else that you're, that you're working on and you want to point people towards. Yeah, man. Uh, so if you want to check us out, if you're interested in a career in beauty, um, cosmetology, nails, esthetician or instructing, uh, you just want services done check us out at www.lastinglayersofbeauty.com um, outside of that i am a social content creator um, public speaker you can check us out may 1st the website launches at v100tv.org or you can find me on all social media platforms on youtube the 100 tv facebook same thing you find me one place you'll find me all places each platform is different um, we've got funny stuff. We've got stuff to make you think, but more importantly, it's not just my voice. It's the voice of countless justice impacted people, um, people up there speaking about mental health, relationships, um, things that I feel matter. And I know a lot of people do too. Um, so yeah, you can check us out at the 100 TV and I say us, cause it's not just me. It's everybody that's supporting the content. Right on Christopher Willers. Thank you for coming on finding freedom. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. All right. That is a wrap for today's show. Um, this week, we don't have any uh, any bonus uh, interview to, uh, to share with you, but um, be sure to uh, join our Patreon, um, Lions of Liberty dot, or patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty or Lions of Liberty dot locals dot com to get all of our great content. Um, also, we have our Lions of Liberty store, Lions of Lions of Liberty dot store. I can't talk today, um, where you can find all of our uh, our T-shirt designs. Uh, I know that you all probably got a lot out of today's interview with Christopher Willers. Just a really, um, really a remarkable guy um, sharing the struggles that he's been through. And how he's really utilized his own skills, both learned and um, you know natural skills, God-given skills, in order to not only navigate prison, but then to find success on the other side um, with his wife in starting a business as a content creator, as a uh, as a five hundred one three C owner, um, just doing great things. One of the really cool takeaways from his story, I just want to highlight again, which I think is really important for almost anything in life that it could be applied to is how Christopher, while he was um, still in prison, but it was getting close to his time that he'll be coming home. And his wife had the idea to start ha to asking him or telling him to give things away. And she started to give him things that he could be working on um, while in prison, but also would help him out and develop skills for when he gets out in the real world. Things like learning about cryptocurrency, um, learning about how to build a credit score, things like that. That is applicable to so many different areas in life. If you are looking to reinvent yourself, um, you know, I always talk about 
um, being uh, resilient and uh, in reinventing your life. So um, reinvention through resi resiliency. And I think people who've been to prison can relate to that. But people in any walk of life who want to reinvent their life, maybe start a business, maybe start a new job, uh, maybe create some alternative sources of income. The ways to do that or to start dipping your toes into those areas and learning about them and uh, kind of building up that curiosity. And as you start to dig, as you start to learn, as you start to, to navigate, you know, these areas in life or businesses that you're interested in, um, that's going to start to build. And you might have to remove things from your plate in order to create that time. You might have to take the Netflix off your plate for a little while. You might have to free up your nights. You might have to free up your weekends. You might have to refocus your energies in order to expand the things that you want to. Well, I think I've rambled long enough for today's show. Hopefully you enjoyed my interview with Christopher Willers, and we will be back next week with another awesome show. But in the meantime, always remember to keep your head up and the fires of Liberty burning.